Gibbs made it. So, um, <laughs> so um, and the reason is our speaker is Mark Gorelick from the University of California at San Diego. Um, it's lovely to welcome him back to La Trobe and I'm so grateful to him for um, staying up this evening to give this seminar at our normal seminar time. Um, Mark visited us a few years ago in early 2017 um, and I think I would have said something at the time along the lines of, and I think it's still true, um, it, Mark only completed his PhD in 2013, but it feels like he's been around for longer. And the reason for that is that he's made such an impact on the field in terms of understanding the linguistic uses of voice quality. Um, and uh, Mark did his undergrad um, in linguistics at McGill University in Montreal. That was in 2008. And then he subsequently did his MA and his PhD in linguistics at the University of California, Los Angeles, um, where his master's thesis was the acoustics of co-articulated non-modal phonation. And his PhD thesis was the production and perception of glottal stops. Um, so that gives you an idea of where his research interests lie. Um, so he's published papers in uh, the Journal of the International Phonetic Association, Glossa, Phonetica, Journal of Phonetics, Laboratory Phonology, Language Cognition and Neuroscience, uh, Journal of Speech, Language and Hearing Research, Journal of the Acoustical Society of America in Phonology. Um, so he's really got an impressive track record of high quality publications for someone who's only a few years out of his PhD. Um, and the reason I was able to rope him to come into <laughs> do this is because um, this year, Mark started up as an associate editor um, at the Journal of the International Phonetic Association, uh, working on the illustrations with myself and uh, Matt Gordon, um, having previously served as an associate editor at the Journal of the, Journal of the Acoustical Society of America. So we're pleased to welcome him at, at JIPA. Um, and today he's actually going to be using the illustrations of the IPA to tell us about um, voicing in glottal sounds. So we're really thrilled to have him. Um, so Mark, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you very much, Maria. And thank you all for coming. Um, let me see if I can get my screen up and running. Um, I believe I'll have to share it with you. Just one moment. Um, let's see. And do, you have, do you have sound recordings to play when you... I do not, surprisingly, okay. for Frenetics Talk. No sound recordings today. All good. Um, <laughs> we know that there are problems with playing sound, so we just right. give up ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's see. I'm going to share this screen here, and then if I make it full screen, hopefully everyone will see it in big. Does it work? Yes, good. Okay. Um, Hmm, I'm getting a message saying, sharing is pause, bring your shared window to the front. Um, that's bizarre, but you see the title page of the talk. Okay, so I guess it's good. Um, so the title of my talk is what illustrations of the IPA can teach us about voicing and glottal sounds. Um, this is some recent work that I'm doing with three graduate student collaborators at UC San Diego, uh, Yuan Chai, Yaqian Huang, and Maxine Van Doren. Um, move some things out of the way so I can see better. Okay, uh, move this out of the way. Okay, so to start off, um, uh, in terms of a little bit of background about voicing and glottal consonants, officially the International Phonetic Alphabet distinguishes three glottal consonants. Most of you will know this, I'm sure. There's the voiceless glottal stop, um, the voiceless glottal fricative, and the voiced glottal fricative. And the Sorry, Mark, can I these. just interrupt yeah. for a second? Mm -hmm. Should we be now looking at a different slide? Um, you should. There should be a slide with uh, the symbols. Maybe if I do this, yes. it'll work. And let's see. Resume share. Yet. Uh, All I can see is your title um, page. Title page. Okay, let me try to fix that. Let's see. What about this one? Yes. Is that better? Okay, it is. thank you. So um, there are three glottal consonants that appear in the International Phonetic Alphabet or IPA. Uh, the voiceless glottal stop, the voiceless glottal fricative, and the voiced glottal fricative. So two voiceless consonants and one voiced. Um, however, we know that voiceless glottal consonants are frequently realized as voiced. Um, and when they're realized as voice sounds, they appear as non-modal phonation. So either breathy or, or creaky voice. For example, the voiceless glottal stop 
will vary freely between a glottal consonant, the voiceless glottal stop, and a creaky vowel. The voiceless glottal fricative will vary between a voiceless or voiced glottal fricative, that's the, medi uh, the middle symbol, um, and the voice glottal fricative is, sen is essentially the same thing as a breathy vowel. Um, so here's an example from Sounds of the World's Languages, um, Latifoga to Madison 96. We have a glottal stop that appears, a singleton glottal stop that appears between two vowels in Lebanese Arabic. And instead of being realized with uh, full glottal occlusion with a period of silence, there's a period of creaky voice in between the A ah and the E. And um, Latifogan and Madison go on to say that in the great majority of languages we have heard, glottal stops are apt to fall short of complete closure, especially in intervocalic positions. We're going to um, look at this in more detail uh, in this talk. Another example that Latifogan and Madison provide is of uh, voicing of H in Gimme, a Papuan language. And so here we have an H in between A and O. And we can see in the waveform that there is voicing throughout this interval. And Latifogan and Madison go on to say that the waveform for the intervocalic voiceless H is that of a breathy voiced H and is similar to the intervocalic voiceless H, uh, excuse me, voiced H that we see in English behold. Um, this very frequent variation between voiceless and voiced glottal sounds has been a uh, topic of concern since the very beginning of the International Phonetic Association. Um, so as early as 1900, Paul Passy um, wrote, um, this is written in IPA, it's in French, um, but written in IPA because back in the day, the journal that was called Le Maître Phonétique was written in IPA mm -hmm. up until I believe 1971. Um, so you can see the original quote in IPA, the quote in French, if you um, read or speak French, below and then in English, I'll read it, I'll, I'll read the translation. But then if voiceless H can be voiced without ceasing to be voiceless H, what is the difference between voiceless H and voiced H? So already in 1900, there was this notion that some languages have a voiceless H and other languages have a voiced H. In particular, the voiced H was found for um, varieties of Arabic as well as um, Czech. Um, and so, Paul uh, Passy was replying to a recent um, article by Meyer about how voiceless H is typically voiced in certain environments, notably between two vowels. And so he called attention to this issue that we have two symbols, one of a voiceless H, the other of a voiced H, um, but we know that the voiceless H is very frequently voiced. Um, there's an additional complication to the um, picture here, and that is that sounds that are voiced um, but have non-modal phonation, so breathy and creaky vowels, also very frequently show variation in voicing. Here are two, uh, four examples, two from auto mongean languages from Mesoamerica and two from Indic languages. In San Juan Galavia Zapotec, the vowels that are called creaky or laryngealized will alternate very regularly um, between being creaky throughout, symbolized um, as follows over here. Can you see my cursor, by the way? If I move my yes. cursor around? Yes, yes? we okay. can. Thank you. So symbolized um, as such. Um, but the laryngealized vowels in Zapotec can also be rearticulated, meaning that they have strong glottal constriction in the middle of the vowel. I've um, transcribed them as such here, but keep in mind this is for one uh, phonemic vowel. And then the same laryngealized vowels can sometimes be checked, meaning that they have a glottal constriction that occurs late in the vowel. Um, in Gujarati, the vowels that are breathy are typically breathiest in the middle of the vowel, and that breathiest portion could be realized as a voiceless H, particularly in careful speech. So here we see that both creaky vowels and breathy vowels can be realized with a portion of voiceless uh, glottal uh, constriction or spreading. Now in Itunyoso Triki, an Otomangayan language, the voiced H can devoice to a voiceless H in careful speech. In fact, in Decanio's earlier um, Jaipa illustration of the language in 2012, he transcribed the sound with a voiceless H symbol, but said that it was very frequently voiced. Um, and then in Nepali, there are reported cross-speaker differences, such that some speakers produce the single glottal fricative as being voiced, and other speakers produce this uh, same glottal fricative as voiceless. 
So um, the picture that emerges is that voiceless glottal sounds very frequently undergo voicing. And conversely, the voiced glottal sounds typically devoice for a portion at least of their duration. So the voiceless glottal stop varies freely between a glottal stop and a creaky vowel. A voiceless glottal fricative varies uh, freely between a voiceless H and a breathy voiced um, H. And the voice glottal fricative in turn will vary between a uh, between voiced and voiceless realizations. So the question for this talk that I want to address is, do voiceless and voice glottal sounds differ from one another in terms of their voicing? And if so, how? And I'm going to address this question by looking at these particular sounds, the glottal consonants um, and non-modal vowels um, that appear in illustrations of the IPA, which are published in Journal of the IPA. And the um, underlying assumption is that we expect to find that voiceless glottal sounds, that's the glottal stop and the voiceless glottal fricative, are going to be less voiced than voiced ones, such as the voice glottal fricative and non-modal vowels, even if there is this frequent uh, variation in voicing. Okay, um, before I go into this particular um, study, however, I wanna give you a little bit of background about why we get so much voicing variation among glottal sounds, uh, glottal consonants and non-modal vowels. Um, the first thing to note is that glottal sounds can be modeled along a single continuum of glottal stricture. Um, and on this continuum lie both glottal consonants and non-modal vowels. So here in this figure, I'm uh, illustrating the continuum of glottal states that uh, first appeared in Latifogan 71 and later restated in, uh, by Gordon and Latifogan. On one end of the continuum, let's say the left end here, we have the glottis being in its most open state. And that represents um, the sound H of a voiceless glottal fricative. At the other end of the continuum, if the glottis is completely closed, we have a voiceless glottal stop. However, if the glottis is um, neither too open or too closed, we end up with what we call a modal vowel, a vowel that has vibration that is neither more spread or more constricted than what we expect for a baseline. Um, in between a voiceless H and a modal vowel is a breathy vowel or the voiced glottal fricative symbol. We assume that they're the same. And then um, to the right of the modal vowel, not quite as constricted as a glottal stop, but less constrict, uh, more constricted rather than modal vowels is the creaky vowel. So both non-modal vowels and glottal consonants can lie on this continuum. Now this continuum, um, I should note, obscures uh, much additional detail about the laryngeal mechanism, particularly with regards to the glottal, the constricted sounds, glottal stop and creaky vowels. Um, but this model nonetheless is sufficiently explanatory for the purposes here. Okay. Um, another important thing to note, given this continuum, is that the production of a voiceless glottal consonant, either H or glottal stop, necessarily entails the presence of non-modal voicing. So I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to illustrate how this, why this is the case. Um, let's say we're looking at the vocal folds. So this circle here represents a um, laryngoscopic, a bird's eye view of the, of the glottis. Um, the triangular play, uh, space here at the bottom of the circle is meant to represent a slight glottal gap, which is very common even in people's modal voice. The arytenoid cartilages, which appear in the posterior part, um, typically are somewhat open, at least they are in my voice. So here's the back of the vocal folds. Here's the, at the top of the circle, the front of the vocal folds. Um, here we have the left vocal fold and the right vocal fold. And in typical modal voice, the vocal folds are vibrating. That's represented by the squiggly line. Um, they vibrate over most of their uh, front to back structure. Okay, so that's the kind of um, view we would see if we were scoping an individual saying the vowel ah. Um, now, if we were scoping the same individual saying the vowel, uh, sorry, saying the sound huh, the glottal fricative, what we would see is that there'd be a wide open glottis. The space between the vocal folds is wide and the vocal folds are far apart from one another to the point of not being able to enter into vibration. Um, and it's important to note that the only difference between a ah and ha, huh, the voiceless H, is the presence or absence of voicing. Assuming that the tongue makes no other changes 
um, there is no other change in the vocal tract filter. Um, H is essentially a voiceless ah in this context. Um, and then um, if I were trying to say, for example, aha, I would be going from a ah to H and then to ah again. But what happens in between? In between, what happens is that the vocal folds need to start spreading um, more to go from a ah to an H. And so we end up with this kind of in-between stage of breathy voicing, where the glottis is opening more than usual, and the breathiness here schematized with bl in blue um, is produced as we transition from a modal vowel into a glottal fricative. The converse would be true if we were going from a modal vowel into a glottal stop. The, vo the voicing would get progressively more constricted, meaning that there would be some creaky voice. Okay, so if there's always going to be a period of non-modal phonation during the production of an H, or I should say adjacent to the production of an H, then if that H, that voiceless glottal fricative, is undershot, meaning it is produced more weakly due to reduction, for example, then what we end up with is non-modal voicing, in particular, breathy voice. The opposite also happens. If we aim for a breathy vowel, but we produce it with increased articulatory strength, then what we might end up with is a breathy vowel that tends towards being completely voiceless. So this is schematized here in a modified continuum. If we have articulatory reduction, H and glottal stop will be brought towards the midline of this continuum, meaning that they'll be produced more like breathy voice or creaky voice. On the other hand, for breathy and creaky vowels, if they're produced with greater articulatory strength, more spreading or more glottal constriction, we end up with a tendency for these sounds to become voiceless. So more similar to voiceless H or more similar to a glottal stop. Okay, so that's why there's this tight connection between non-modal vowels and glottal consonants. Now let's look to see whether there is in fact a systematic difference between consonants that we call voiceless glottal sounds and non-modal vowels and voiced H. So the corpus it represents all illustrations of the IPA published in the handbook of the IPA in 99 up until, well, today, because I'm still looking for new incoming illustrations. Um, so far, we have uh, over 1,200 tokens from um, 269 languages. So not every language is represented in this corpus because not every language has a, has a target sound, which I'll talk about momentarily. There are certain advantages and disadvantages of using illustrations to, well, illustrate this point. Um, so I'm just going to lay them out um, openly right now. Um, for some advantages, we know that illustrations provide high quality audio from a variety of languages. Um, an advantage in particular for this study is that the words in illustrations typically appear in isolation, and that helps us get at a more canonical or hyper-articulated pronunciation of these sounds. And that's going to be a relevant point uh, later on. Uh, also, many of the words are minimal or near minimal pairs with one another, thus um, minimizing the differences between them. And um, very importantly, the transcriptions have been peer reviewed, which means that we can be fairly confident in the choice of symbols used by the authors. However, there are certain disadvantages. Um, the main disadvantages are that there are very few tokens per language generally, um, and usually the data come from a single speaker, though not always. Okay, so the target sounds in the study were the glottal consonants, uh, that's the voiceless glottal stop, the voiceless glottal fricative, and the breathy voiced glottal fricative, as well as breathy and creaky vowels. Um, by creaky vowels here, I'm referring to any vowel that has some kind of constriction gesture associated with it. So that could be a vowel transcribed or described as being laryngealized or creaky, a vowel that's rearticulated, meaning that has a constriction, glottal constriction centered towards the middle of the vowel, or a checked vowel, a vowel that has glottal constriction centered towards the end of the vowel. Um, we've excluded epiglottal consonants or vowels that have harsh phonation um, because these sounds are assumed to have um, constriction downstream from the glottis, and that additional constriction would probably favor voicelessness uh, due to aerodynamic and respiratory constraints. And so to avoid that confound, we excluded any description of a sound that was epiglottal or um, harsh. Uh, 
um, we also analyzed only words that appear in isolation um, in three different positions. And these are the uh, positions by word or utterance because uh, they overlapped. So for example, we looked at initial H, that would be a word initial H, also an utterance initial H. Um, we looked at medial contexts, so either a um, intervocalic H, either voiceless or voiced, or in the case of uh, non-modal vowels, we looked at um, medial context referred to um, a breathy vowel that did not occur at the end of the word. A final context would include a word final voiceless H, for example, or a breathy vowel at the very end of the word with no coda consonant. Okay, uh, we avoided any other contexts, for example, words taken from the North Wind and the Sun or other passages, um, as well as words taken from larger phrases, just because we wanted to be sure that we were controlling as much as possible for any kind of phrasal effect on the production of voicing. Okay, uh, just a note about where these um, sound files are coming from. Um, here's a uh, a map, who doesn't like a map of where languages are spoken? And so here's a map of where the glottal stops and other target sounds come from in illustrations of the IPA. So looking at the top two facets, we can see that glottal stops and voiceless H are well represented um, among languages of the world that have illustrations. Um, and I, would, I think the uh, tally is that glottal stops appear in 45% of illustrations and voiceless H in about 65% of illustrations. And this is actually quite um, similar to the proportions of languages in LAPSID, the Lyon-Albuquerque um, Phonological Systems Database that has many more languages than JIPA. Um, so very similar percentages. So um, these sounds occur across the world in every large language area. On the other hand, looking at voiced H in the bottom left here, we see that there are many fewer languages that have this sound, and they are concentrated both genetically and aerially. Um, the majority of languages with voiced H are varieties of Dutch or neighboring languages like Limburgish, um, as well as Afrikaans down at the bottom of South Africa. Um, there are a few languages in the um, Sino-Tibetan family that have voiced H, um, but if we include uh, Dutch, oh, I forgot also Czech and um, Slovak and Ukrainian, uh, the vast majority of languages with this sound are um, Indo-European languages, particularly Germanic languages. For non-modal vowels, um, we see that there are very few languages that have them, um, but then again, non-modal vowels are um, fairly infrequent in languages of the world and tend to be um, used in certain parts of the world. For example, in uh, Southeast Asia, they are more common than they are in other uh, language areas. Um, another thing I should note is that voiced H is overrepresented in JIPA illustrations relative to LAPSID. Um, so I think in LAPSID, it's 2% of languages that have voiced H, but in JIPA illustrations, it's 11 or 12%. So a much higher representation. And I'll get back to that point later on in this talk. Okay, in terms of segmentation, we defined two, real, uh, two relevant uh, intervals of interest, the aspiration interval and the glottalization interval. The aspiration interval refers to where F1 or F2, or both F1 and F2, the first and second formants, uh, were excited by noise instead of by voicing. Um, so that means that we didn't rely on the presence of voicing to determine what counted as the aspirated interval. We relied solely on the presence of noise over the first two formants. The glottalization interval, on the other hand, was defined where F0 or glottal period, glottal pulses are irregular, either in terms of their period or in terms of their amplitude, um, and or if there is full glottal occlusion, meaning a period of silence. So we see full glottal occlusion in this example here. Um, in this example here, the voicing is irregular on the right. Uh, the voicing is very irregular, um, but there isn't a period of sustained glottal uh, closure. Okay, um, for the analysis, I'm going to focus on two specific measures of voicing. One is the percentage of voicing over the course of the target interval. Um, this was taken from the voice report in Pratt using uh, the cross-correlation algorithm. And 
Also, we're looking at the intensity of voicing during the interval. This was measured by strength of excitation, or SOE, which is a measure of the intensity of voicing independent of um, any noise or from the vocal tract. Okay, um, so moving on to the results, I'm going to show you a very large figure and um, I'll walk you through it bit by bit. So there's three facets here. Um, the three facets refer to the different phrasal positions um, because we expected to find uh, quite different results by phrase and sure enough, that is what we find. Um, on the y-axis, on the left here, we have percentage voicing from zero to 100. And then on the x-axis, we have the um, different sounds of interest. Now we're just focusing on the aspirated sounds. So voiceless H, voiced H, and breathy vowels. Breathy vowels do not appear word initially without a preceding consonant, and so they don't appear in this first facet here. Okay, so these are um, essentially scatter plots or, or swarm plots. Um, every dot in a figure represents a token. So what you can see, for example, for H in uh, word initial position is that there are some tokens of H that are fully voiced, 100%, have 100% voicing over their interval, and other tokens that have no voicing. They are fully voiceless, but there are many other tokens in between. The average percent voicing for uh, voiceless H is about 30%. If we look at voiced H in word initial position, we see a very similar result. We have many fewer tokens because there are fewer languages with the sound, but we have some tokens that are fully voiceless, some tokens, maybe two, that are fully voiced, and then sounds, uh, tokens that have some voicing uh, along this uh, continuum. On average, the um, voiced H is, uh, has about 40% voicing. So we're dealing with 30 versus roughly 40% voicing. So very similar um, averages in terms of how much voicing there is. Now moving on to medial position, for example, a word like aha, um, voiceless H now has a much higher spread of data, meaning that most tokens, oops, excuse me, most tokens um, are in the um, higher end of the percentage. Um, in fact, the average is around 83% voicing. Many tokens are fully voiced. There are some tokens that have less voicing, um, but the vast majority of tokens appear above to have more than 50% voicing over their interval. So these could be very easily described as voiced sounds. Voiced H on the other hand, 100% voiced in all our tokens, although um, there are only six tokens of intervocalic voiced H among all the illustrations of, of the IPA. Uh, breathy vowels, we have I think 30 tokens, are also about 100% voiced. So there are differences between breathy vowels voiced H versus voiceless H, um, with voiceless H showing more spread. However, on average, voiceless H is still largely voiced, and this difference might be more due to, a fact, due to the fact that voiceless H has more tokens overall than these other categories. In final position, the percentage voicing for voiceless H decreases to about 67%, um, but it is still over 50% voiced in this environment. There are very few tokens that have less than, say, 25% voicing over their interval. Um, voiced H and breathy vowels, on the other hand, show more variation in final position than in medial position, but are largely uh, voiced for most of their duration. Okay, so that's percentage voicing. Now let's look at the intensity of voicing, or SOE, strength of excitation. Um, this has been log transformed. I'm not showing you numbers here because they're essentially meaningless. Um, but what's important to note is this is a time course. So now we're looking at from zero to 100% of the duration of the interval. Just looking at voices H, we see that in initial position, um, there, the, the aspiration interval starts out essentially voiceless and stays very weakly voiced throughout most of its duration. But starting at about the 60 seven percent, so two-thirds mark, there is a rapid increase in the intensity of voicing. In medial position, voiced H, uh, voiceless H excuse me, starts out strongly voiced, shows a little bit of a dip, and then rises again in terms of its voicing intensity. But notice that the trough, the lowest point of voicing intensity, is very close to the highest point of voicing intensity for an initial H. So we can't really say that this sound in medial position is really devoicing. The voicing does weaken, but not 
very much to the point of having voicelessness. And in final position, the voicing starts out intense and then um, falls off fairly logarithmically uh, towards the end of the um, aspirated interval. So that's what we see for voiceless H. Now let's compare voiced H. So in initial position, the two contours look very similar, except that in the latter half of the vowel, voiced H has more, voice, more uh, intense voicing than voiceless H. But I think it's important to note that at the very beginning of the interval and at the very end of the interval, these two sounds are converging in terms of how much intensity of voicing there is. We're going from essentially voiceless to strongly voiced. It's just the slope of this trajectory that differs. In medial position, there isn't much difference between these contours. In final position, we also see voiced H falling off in terms of its voicing intensity, but it doesn't reach quite as low a value as it does uh, for voiceless H. Now, breathy vowels generally look fairly similar to voiced H, which we would expect. But it's also noteworthy to see that the breathy vowels do tend towards voicelessness by the end of their interval in word slash utterance final position. OK. Now moving on to glottalized sounds, glottal stops and creaky vowels. Here we've separated out the categories um, into a bit more detail based on the description. So I'm gonna start by talking first about initial position. Again, we have percentage voicing on the y-axis. In initial position, we only have glottal stop. And um, just like with voiceless H, we have some tokens that are fully voiceless, other tokens that are fully voiced, and many tokens that fall in between the two ends of the continuum. And um, in the case of glottal stops, they're averaging about 55% voicing over the course of their interval. That doesn't change much from an initial to medial and final position, except that in medial position, the glottal stop tends to have slightly more voicing, which we would expect. Still, there are some tokens with weak voicing or no voicing at all. Now, if we look at the creaky vowels, vowels described as creaky, these, these vowels do have more voicing than glottal stops, both in medial position and in final position. Um, vowels that are called checked, meaning that have late glottal constriction, or vowels described as rearticulated with medial um, constriction, tend to look very similar to glottal stops in terms of their percentage of voicing. Slightly higher um, percentage voicing, but um, not a significant difference. If we look now at the um, SOE, that is the intensity of voicing over the uh, time course of the interval, we see that glottal stops show a linear increase from very low voicing or no voicing to a stronger voicing over the course of their interval. In medial position, voicing intensity uh, decreases substantially to the point where the lowest portion of the glottalization interval has roughly the same low intensity as glottal stops at the very beginning of, a utterance, of an utterance or a word. Uh, word finally, glottal stops start out with strong voicing and then decrease somewhat logarithmically towards uh, a very low or voiceless target. Now when we look at the creaky vowels, we see a different picture. Creaky vowels in word medial position are strongly voiced and don't show a sizable dip um, over the course of their duration. In final position, there is a slight dip in intensity, but notice how it doesn't fall anywhere close to what we see for glottal stop. Um, the rearticulated vowels look identical to a medial glottal stop. Um, in final position, however, there is a, an initial dip, and then there's more of a plateau towards the end. So the voicing weakens towards the middle of the vowel and stays weak um, throughout the rest of the, the remaining portion of the vowel. For checked vowels, those that have late constriction, uh, we see a slightly different pattern. So in medial position, the intensity falls towards the end of the interval and then stays fairly flat. In final position, we see a contour that is essentially the same as the glottal stop, though it happens to end with an even weaker intensity than the glottal stop. Okay, so let me summarize the results. <clears throat> 
we find that voiceless glottal stop and H show a wide range in percentage of voicing, as well as changes in their strength of voicing. Except in initial position, voiceless H is actually mostly voice, both in terms of percentage voicing, as well as in terms of the intensity of the voicing, though there is a tendency in phrase final position towards devoicing. In initial position, both voiceless and breathy voiced H have less than 50% voicing. And in fact, they differ very slightly in terms of their voicing intensity. Vowels that are labeled as being creaky or laryngealized tend to have more voicing and stronger voicing than vowels that are described as being checked or rearticulated, even though all of these categories can be considered creaky under some uh, definition. Vowels labeled as checked and rearticulated also behave very similarly to a glottal stop, either in medial or final position, depending on whether it's checked or rearticulated. Okay, so moving on to a discussion now and conclusion, we can go back to Passy's question, which was, if, if voiceless H can be voiced without ceasing to be voiceless H, what is the difference then between voiceless H and voiced H? Well, the difference turns out to be quite minimal. If there are voicing differences between voiceless and breathy voiced H, then those differences are slight in this sample. And I think it's very notable to state that in this sample, we find very minimal differences because this sample provides hyper-articulated speech, canonical speech of what we would expect for a voiceless and voiced H. So even in this kind of hyper-articulated style, we're finding very minimal differences, which would lead me to predict at least that in more conversational or spontaneous speech styles, the differences between these sounds would be even weaker. Um, the differences that might exist between voiceless and voiced H are probably going to be most salient at phrase edges and not in between two vowels, where there's a tendency towards strong voicing. Now, going back to the notion that voiced H is genetically and aerially limited, um, it's important to note that, as I mentioned, that these voiced H's are coming largely from Germanic languages, including Afrikaans, as well as some Sino-Tibetan languages, um, and Germanic languages are very highly overrepresented in illustrations of the IPA. And so if this sample of languages were more genetically and aerially balanced, we would actually have very few tokens of voice stage to work with at all. Um, so we can ask, however, what about languages that have voiceless and voice stage that contrast with one another? All right, we know that this can happen, um, but these contrasts are in fact exceedingly rare. In Lapsid, which has over 600 languages, only two cases were noted. So I'll go through them in detail, in some detail rather. Um, Umbundu, a Bantu language from Angola, contrasts an oral voiceless H and a nasalized voiced H. However, the phonetic nature of the contrast has yet to be established clearly. In Hainanese Min, a Sino-Tibetan language, a Sinitic language from China, um, this language contrasts voiceless H versus voiced H, but phonetically the contrast might be more, um, might have more to do with voiceless H versus null onset, where the null onset might have some breathiness, but not necessarily consistent um, voiced breathiness. Um, similarly, in Shanghainese Wu, um, this, doesn't appear, this language doesn't appear in Lapsid, but it's often claimed to have a contrast between voiceless H and voiced H. But in a recent JIPA illustration, this contrast was reanalyzed as one between voiceless H and a null onset, where the null onset can vary between being realized as a glottal stop or as a breathy voiced H. At any rate, though, in uh, Wu languages, Voiceless H and voiced H are associated with distinct registers. And so the register contrast, which involves changes in pitch as well as voicing, um, might help signal this difference, uh, this contrast, more than voicing itself. In JIPA illustrations, there are four other languages beyond, besides uh, Shanghainese that have a voiceless H versus voiced H contrast. One is Basa, a Niger-Congo language uh, from Cameroon. Um, and then uh, three other uh, Sino-Tibetan languages, in fact, Tibeto-Burman languages, um, Lizu and two varieties of Shumi. Um, so here's an example of lower Shumi, voiceless H versus voiced H in initial position. 
Um, I've labeled the interval that would be called the aspiration interval in the analysis. So where um, F1 shown here and F2 are excited by noise rather than by voicing. Um, here in the voice stage, um, we see that F1 starts to get excited by voicing at this point here. Before that, however, there's um, mostly aspiration noise. So what you can see is that there is actually a difference between these sounds. Um, the difference could be seen in terms of voicing. In the waveform here, we see regular vibration throughout the interval. Whereas for voiceless H, there's some voicing at the very end of the interval. There's a little blip here that looks like it has voicing. Um, but we also see that the intensity profile is different. The voicing intensity, if the voicing, if present, is weak in intensity up until the end. Whereas for a voiced H, the intensity of voicing gradually increases. Okay, a little bit more detail about contrast between voiceless versus voiced H. The Nguni languages of Southern Africa, these include languages like Zulu and Xhosa, often contrast a voiceless H, which is a non-depressor, and a voiced H that is a depressor. Now by depressor, I mean that these consonants contribute to a um, more abstract contrast in terms of consonants that trigger a um, F0 lowering on a following vowel, that would be the depressor consonants and consonants that do not trigger the lowering of F0 on a following vowel. Those are the non-depressor consonants like voiceless H. So at least in Zulu, um, Trail and colleagues showed that this contrast has more to do with F0 than it does with voicing proper. In fact, the other depressor consonants are often realized as voiceless. And across Nguni languages in general, this contrast is known to be phonetically multidimensional. So it's quite possible, though it is, yes, it is yet to be determined systematically, that the voiceless H and voiced H in the Nguni languages do not differ systematically in terms of voicing, but instead differ systematically in terms of F0 or other cues in addition to voicing. The bottom line here is that these contrasts need more phonetic description, and we're really lacking in such phonetic description. For vowels with laryngeal constriction, so creaky vowels, rearticulated vowels, and the like, the illustrations of the IPA show clearly that there are different types of creaky. Um, on the one hand, creaky vowels differ in terms of the strength of their constriction, whether the constriction is strong, leading to devoicing, or weak, leading to stable voicing. Um, but the vowels also differ in terms of the phasing or timing of the constriction. Vowels described as creaky and laryngealized usually have a vowel that is strongly voiced, therefore weakly constricted, throughout the duration. Rearticulated vowels, on the other hand, have strong constriction tending towards devoicing in the middle of the vowel, and checked vowels have strong constriction phased towards the end of the vowel. So it's important that um, we keep in mind that when we call a vowel creaky, we might be referring to any one of these um, classes of creaky vowels. Now, for the discussion, I want to talk briefly about how we can improve documenting voicing in glottal or laryngeal sounds. First off, if we assume that a language has a voiced H, we should be asking ourselves, what evidence do we have that the sound is in fact a voiced H rather than a voiceless H? If the evidence is phonetic, meaning the presence of voicing, then we're not on very solid ground because as I've shown you before, voiced H tends to be voiceless, at least in um, initial position and uh, often in final position as well. And voiceless H tends to be voiced intervocalically. So phonological evidence might be less problematic than phonetic evidence. For example, if the sound that's being described as a voice H behaves phonologically like other voiced sounds in the language. Um, but generally, I'd advocate for providing plenty of phonetic evidence for how voiceless H and voiced H would differ in languages that contrast these two sounds. If you have just one sound, it might make more sense to describe it as voiceless H, given our uh, understanding that voiceless H is very likely to be voiced. For creaky vowels, um, we should document the phasing of the constriction. So we should be able, excuse me, we should be able to um, describe the constriction as appearing in, during the whole vowel, the end of the vowel, the middle of the vowel, or a variety of phasings. 
And what should we be documenting in more detail beyond this? Well, if we have a contrast between voiceless and voiced H, it would really be good to document in greater phonetic detail how these two sounds differ. If we have an intervocalic glottal stop or voiceless H that is consistently voiceless, that would be surprising. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. In fact, in our sample, we do have some tokens like this, but they're rare. And so if a language does have consistent devoicing of a glottal stop and voiceless H in intervocalic position, that might suggest that the language has some kind of constraint against voicing, um, or it's due to phonetic reasons, like these sounds are particularly long. Maybe they're geminates, and the longer constriction would favor voicelessness. Um, a contrast between intervocalic voiceless or voiced H would be quite unusual and worth documenting in detail, but also a contrast between any one of these sounds and breathy vowels. Because as we've seen earlier, a voiceless H in between two vowels looks strikingly similar to a breathy vowel. Um, finally, any language that has a contrast between a, a vowel plus glottal stop sequence versus a checked vowel, um, that would be an interesting contrast that would um, benefit from greater phonetic detail so we can understand how these two very similar articulations actually differ from one another. Uh, and the same is true for an intervocalic glottal stop compared to rearticulated vowels. Um, so to conclude, um, we know that illustrations, especially the older ones, tend to have very little phonetic data. And this has been um, brought to attention in a recent uh, uh, paper by Whalen colleagues in JIPA. However, um, I hope that this talk has shown you that illustrations can still be used to explore cross-linguistic tendencies sorry for the typo here, cross-linguistic tendencies, and to make predictions that could then be val validated with subsequent confirmatory studies with more data. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, Thank you. So you're getting your applause there. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Listen, I mean, I have a question, but... Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to let other people go first in case they have questions. Um, we've got a solid 10 minutes and we don't need to finish bang on time. Um, so if anyone wants to go first, you can put your hand up or you can type in chat or you can do all sorts of things. <laughs> I, I had not, not a question, but a, a couple of comments that, that might be relevant. Sure. Uh, for, from my, my, you know, from the group of languages that I, I know a little bit about, the Hmong Mian languages. Uh, just, just two little things. Um, uh, one is that you were talking about, um, you know, there are very few languages that are reported to have a contrast between uh, initial voiceless H and initial voiced H. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would add that there is one, one uh, Hmong Mian language called Ahmao, which is reported to have such a contrast, but I, I don't know if it's been investigated phonetically properly in the way that would be useful to you. Thank you, uh, I'll take a look. Yeah, but uh, the other thing though, uh, maybe a little more interesting, and this is from a language that I actually worked on myself, and, and, uh, uh, and that's a language called Mun, also a Hmong Mian language, where, where I heard a uh, contrast, a phonemic contrast between uh, creaky vowels and checked vowels. Mm. Um, yeah, so in Hmong, I've done some work on white and green Hmong, and um, it's rather interesting because um, I have done uh, a little bit of work on the phonetics of these, uh, the creaky tone, um, mm -hmm. so the, the M tone, and um, I've called it creaky, but in fact, it behaves very much like a checked vowel in that there is creak throughout the vowel, but the strongest constriction is clearly at the end of the vowel. Yes, and yes. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about white tongue. I'm talking about a different language uh, that's also in the family, but it's called mm. Mun, M-U-N. Oh, M-U-N, okay. Yeah, um, it's, 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 uh, it's in the Mianic branch of the family. I see, uh, and it's reported to have a contrast between checked and creaky. Yeah, but by me, I mean, I, I, I actually heard this. I, I actually wrote a little paper on right. the tones of this language and I, yeah. I heard this, so yeah. So, yeah, so Thank that's, you. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to add, you know, some, give you a couple more examples, you know. Of, yeah, that's great. You know, this Thank kind of you. Thank you. were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say there's one illustration that has a similar contrast, that's Burmese, um, that has a reported contrast between a creaky vowel and a 
um, or a creaky tone and a check tone. Um, the contrast seems pretty strong in the illustration, but in a recent um, dissertation mm -hmm. by uh, James Gruber, um, he found that the constriction is still strongest at the end of the vowel, both for a creaky vowel and a check tone, uh, a, a creaky tone and a check tone. Um, but they differ systematically in terms of their duration. And so mm -hmm. that might actually be a contrast in duration more than a contrast in phasing or strength mm -hmm. of the laryngeal yeah. constriction. Um, and I wonder if it would be the same in Moon then. Um, might so thank be, you. yeah, might well be. And, and, oh, and tell me well, about the creaky tone in white Hmong and green Hmong, because I was very interested in, in that, because I'm very familiar with that tone, but what, what the, the sound of it wasn't exactly creaky, it was more like a... More checked, well, I mean, yeah. people have yeah. reported it as being checked. Um, I yeah. typically describe it as creaky because it is creaky throughout, but it is creakiest at the end. And so yeah. its articulation is consistent with a an, an analysis of it being a checked um, yeah. syllable. Yeah. 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 So more work there would be needed. Yes. Thanks, thanks David Strecker. We've um, got a little question from um, David Bradley. And David, I don't know if you've got a microphone, but um, David's saying that diachronically, the Slavic languages, Czech, Slovak, and Ukrainian, the voice H came from proto vela relatively mm -hmm. recently, Mark. Do you have a comment on that? And David, do you know any example words? Because I apparently speak Slavic languages, and I'm wondering if you've got any words in mind, but I'll let Mark reply to... I, act, I do have, I can even maybe pull up, if I can find it quickly, a figure from, because Ukrainian, Czech, and Slovak all have illustrations. Um, so, for example, the word gora for mountain is... Hora in um, Czech, I believe also in Ukrainian, though I'm sure the vowel is different and whatnot. But um, so the Czech word for mountain is Hora. Um, and it is voiced um, throughout the duration, though there were some tokens in the illustration that were voiceless, actually, at least for the beginning portion. Um, but it is possible, um, like David mentions, it's possible that this um, the voicing is more stable because it reflects a relatively recent um, uh, change in the language. So um, losing that velar articulation, but retaining the voicing of the G. Um, and then maybe over time that H would devoice completely. Is there any reason why velars would be particularly prone to that kind of debucalization? Um, that's a good question. Okay. I was wondering yeah. why the velas were being targeted because, yeah. I right. think in many Slavic, in many East and, and um, West Slavic languages, there is a tendency for the um, velar, the voiced velar to be realized as a velar fricative. And yeah, that's why I, I was, yeah, yeah. And so maybe it's just, it reflects a, a later stage in the lenition process whereby the voiced velar fricative becomes uh, debuccalized and retains its voicing at least temporarily. Okay. Um, but I don't know why why the velar fricative rather than another uh, rather velar stop rather than another stop. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has got a question, but I wanted to ask a question. Um, first of all, I wanted to say this is a really great example of um, I, I think who knows when field work can start, mm -hmm. and we have to work with existing recordings. Um, and you know these kinds of recordings are great for little projects like you know like like this or a student project or stuff like that. So. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, get, so is, that. but my question was actually related to you had a, a throwaway comment somewhere early on, I thought you were going to follow up on it about prosodic strengthening, and relating to the states of the vocal folds. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, do you just want to, I, I just didn't quite get it. That's all. Oh, I, let I, me pull it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> have it explained to me again. Yeah, I, I Talk Jenna's about this. So, too, so maybe she's got a specific question, but I just need to have it explained. <laughs> sure. So, okay. The idea is that the glottal consonants, um, H and glottal stop and non-modal vowels appear on the same continuum. Yeah. And um, the more strongly you articulate a um, glottal consonant, the more you're going to target the canonical production. So um, the most open uh, constriction um, position of the vocal folds or the most closed position of the vocal folds for a glottal stop. So you target those, those um, extreme productions. But if, you're, if you don't end up with an extreme production, the vocal folds are vibrating around these glottal consonants because generally we have a vowel before or a sonorant or something before. So let's say I'm saying aha, uh -huh, 
if I'm going from a, which is modal, to h, so I have to go this way on the continuum, but I don't quite reach the target, then I end up with this breathy vowel. So h, if it's realized more weakly, is going to be um, produced as a breathy vowel. Okay. Um, likewise for a breathy, let's say your target is a breathy vowel, like in Hmong, the breathy tone. Um, but you target, to produce a breathy vowel, you have to spread the vocal folds. But if you aim for too much articulatory strength, or not aim, but if you end up with too much articulatory strength, the spreading gesture is going to be so great in magnitude that instead of going from a modal vowel to breathy, you end up going all the way to the end of the continuum. And you, therefore, you end up with a voiceless sound at the end, let's say, of the breathy vowel. I think it's for this reason that breathy vowels typically end in voiceless aspiration, because you're targeting a spreading gesture of the vocal folds, but you don't need to go and stop halfway, let's say at this point here, and just have consistent breathy voice. You can keep going, and at the end you'll have voiceless aspiration, but what matters is it sounds breathy because you've, tra you've traversed, you've crossed through this region here of breathy voicing. I don't know if that helps explain. I think a little bit clearer now, yeah, what you were trying to, and it, it relates back then to your diagram of the states of the vocal folds. Right, yeah. So whenever you are going towards a voiceless consonant, a voiceless glottal consonant, you necessarily pass through these intermediate stages um, with breathy and creaky voicing. You have to. There's no other way to get to these endpoints except to go along this continuum. Okay, thank you. Yes. Janet, do you have a question? You need to have yourself, Janet. Yep, I have. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark, for a lovely talk. And, and Thank you. again, like if I can echo Maria's sentiments, it's great to see these resources being used in this way. You know, when I was listening to your talk, because uh, uh, I'm old, <laughs> an old study came to mind by um, Pierre Humbert and Tolkien. Do you mm -hmm. recall that study? And yeah. And I, 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 and I think much of what you're saying really resonates with some of you limited because they were dealing with a fairly limited range of data for American English, obviously, mm -hmm. as well, and not, not this wonderful cross-linguistic stuff that you presented here. But I guess one of the conclusions that they really drew from their work was, yes, uh, the, there were the prosodic elements that you've just so nicely explained, but also they, they really mm -hmm. came out saying things about, well, it may be a more a Broman and Goldstein type under phonological representation is perhaps capturing this kind of variation better than our traditional IPA type categories. So I just wondered if you, you know, I don't want to be too controversial, but um, <laughs> I think your work is lending itself to this sort of view, isn't it, in a way? Right. I think it's yeah. useful when dealing with glottal sounds to think of them in terms of just two articulations or gestures, yeah. Um, yeah. spreading of the vocal folds and constricting of the vocal folds. Now, the sounds might act phonologically as consonants um, in a particular language. But physiologically, what we're doing is we're spreading our vocal folds to produce an H, and we're constricting them to produce a glottal stop. And when we do that, we end up with this non-modal phonation in between, and that's just inevitable. So everything about glottal sounds is controversial, I think more so than for other segments. Um, because, for example, um, the, whether they're glottal is controversial. Um, because, uh, for example, John Essling would say they're laryngeal, at least a glottal stop is laryngeal. Whether they're stops or fricatives is controversial because they don't behave exactly like other stops and fricatives. They don't have focal tract constriction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think this talk, um, one point I really want to make is that even the voicing is controversial. That really what we're dealing with is two gestures that are, or articulations that are, in many cases, probably unspecified for the degree, whether you go from slightly spread to fully spread, it doesn't matter in many cases. If you are aiming for spreading, that's what you're going to get. Um, and same with constriction. You just aim to constrict the vocal folds and you might end up with a voiceless glottal stop or you might end up with a creaky vowel. And so I think at least an understanding that these sounds are articulatorily um, a continuum of spreading and constriction is particularly useful. Whether that means phonologically we need to think about them as um, purely articulatory gestures is another very different question, though. Thanks, that's terrific. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Have we got any more questions? Nothing else.
Um, no, so I can't quite. Mark, perhaps you'd like to unshare your screen. Yes. <laughs> Here we all are. Well, if, if there's no more questions, um, I think we might finish up on time. Well, or not too badly out of time. So um, I'll thank you so much, Mark, for, um, I need to go away and think, so I need to go away and think about the state of the, the vocal folds. Um. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. No, thanks so much thank you all coming. for coming. Thank you. It's wonderful. Yes. Thanks everyone for coming.